and we should be live. Hi everyone. This is Mahabeli from the University of in Egypt for Equity Unbound. Um, Christian is helping with this hangout technique, uh, but I'm joined with my co-facility Zamora and Cronin, who is also our, our co-facilitator, is coming soon. Um, and this hangout is about privacy. Um, and our guests today are Chris Gilliard and Autumn Keynes and Christian Friedrich, <laughs> who's doing a dual role today. Um, and we've also got a few of my students and Anne-Marie Scott from Edinburgh. And I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves. And now I have to think of a smart question to ask them. What, um, maybe, I mean, since the topic is privacy, what's a recent story that either happened to you or that you heard about related to privacy that is interesting? So uh, I'll go last. <laughs> so uh, who wants to go first? Who's got a story to share right away? I don't have a story, but I'll start the introductions. I'll second the introductions. My name's Mia Zamora. Um, I'm also a co-facilitator at Bunbound Eck. And when Maha, oh, and I'm in New Jersey um, uh, in the US at Kane University. And when Maha just said, do you have a story about privacy? My mind went blank, but I did think, then I thought, well, it's not a story, but I'll just say this. Most people I know think that they have nothing to hide, which is, I think, a real misnomer. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that, so. Okay, how about Chris, Christian, and Autumn go next in whatever order you think you're ready for? Hi, I am, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm Chris Gilliard, uh, coming to you from Michigan. Um, I don't have a story, although I do have something interesting. I Last year I had a super long thread about um, all the privacy invasive things that tech companies have done. And it's had a resurgence, Autumn. It's been about a year since we did that. And uh, now it's back. So I don't, I'm not sure why that is, but is lots of, lots more the, people are on the contributing Unbound. to it. It's on the Equity Unbound scavenger hunt. We tweeted three oh, times. Oh, that's it, okay. That's fine. <laughs> I think it is. I usually put it, I can't, I think it is. Not everyone did it, but it was there. I think you have to say what it is now. You can't just say there was a Twitter thread. You have to say what the, <laughs> what the thread is about. Oh, it was just, um, it was a large collection of terrible uh, privacy invasive practices that um, companies have done. Um, many of which sound too absurd to be real, but all of which are real. And I think it had like 2,000 replies or something. But it's up to, it's up to almost 5,000. Yeah. Oh, wow. Really? really? Yeah, oh, it got God. huge. <laughs> okay, I'm going to right. enforce the order now. Yeah. All go. right. Is that the order? I just saw the order pop up. Okay. So, um, hi, my name is Autumn Keynes, and I'm an instructional designer at. Uh, um, St. Norbert College in Green Bay, Wisconsin, but that's not where I'm at right now. I'm actually visiting family in Michigan. I'm just, I'm in Temperance, Michigan right now. Last night I was in Brooklyn, Michigan. Tomorrow I'm going to be in Dearborn, Michigan. I'm like doing the Michigan tour. If you're in Michigan, hit me up. I'm going to put the tour <laughs> on my website. No, I'm not. But <laughs> um, an interesting story about privacy. So, um, I don't have an interesting story necessarily, but I did just get back from the Educause conference where I ran a, uh, a session with uh, Sunday Richard and Michael Berman and George Station where we asked the question, what do we owe students when we collect their data? It was a big, broad question. We did some blogging beforehand. We did some Twitter chats beforehand. Um, <clears throat> and then we ran the session uh, at Educause like a, um, like a discussion session. So we broke people up into different groups and we had a series of questions for them to work through. There was the big question, but then we also had, um, you know, some, some other like smaller questions. And it was really interesting to me that um, everybody right off the bat um, felt very defensive. So if you don't know, Educause is, uh, it's a big tech conference. 
And there are a fair number of educators there, but I think most of the people there um, come at things from more of a technical standpoint. Um, and, and I felt like they were very defensive, several people, not everyone, but several people were very defensive right off the bat. Um, and I had to sort of remind them, I was like, no, I'm not saying like justify taking student data. I'm not saying um, we shouldn't take student data. The question is, what do we owe students when we take their data? And it was just really interesting to me that on several different occasions, I had to clarify the question um, because people got really kind of defensive about it. So I'll pass it over to Chris John, I guess. Hi, everybody. Um, glad to be here. My name is Christian. I'm the Education and Science Advisor to Wikimedia Germany, or as we say, Wikimedia Deutschland. Um, I also work as a consultant and, and I'm involved in many other things. I actually don't have a, so my, I don't have an interesting story about privacy, more almost of a rant almost. Um, so I'd be coming home from, from a meeting today, I listened to a German speaking podcast where they, a 32 year old guy who pretty much looks like me and he talked about taking all the data um, that he can publicly have or he envisioned society's data to be put onto the blockchain um, for um, public use of and that actually made me think of, of Chris's tweet on, on the one hand um, but it also made me um, install or almost install little snitch an app that you might know um from from mac that lets you know whenever an app tries to call home and doing some research about that i installed um, i ended up installing an open source alternative to that and i actually um found out which apps are trying to call home right now so that was my preparation for tonight not a great story but might be in a segue into the conversation down the road Yeah, I'm sorry, clarifying apps calling home is basically um, the, the, the app little snitch or the one I'm using right now, Lulu, it's called, um, basically um, sends you an alert whenever uh, a desktop app or uh, a browser or whatever it is, um, is trying to connect to an unauthorized server of some sort. And it lets you know whether the um, app that is trying to do that is actually signed by a developer, whether it's certified and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I think it's from the E.T. movie, um, Calling Home. I'm not even sure what the, the English, what, what he says in the English original version of the movie, but I'm sure someone can help me out there. Phone home, okay, so should have said that. Okay, Calling Home, we have a dispute now. Maybe the British version is different than the American version. Might be. Okay, Amory, you're up. Okay, hi there. Um, I'm Anne-Marie Scott, I'm at Maha says from the University of Edinburgh um, and I run all of our EdTech systems, that's probably a short way of putting, of putting what I do. Um, and I, do I have an interesting privacy story? No. Uh, I have a really boring privacy story about Office 365, which I tweeted out yesterday. Um, and I think a recently released report commissioned by the Dutch government has shown that Office 365 and Microsoft have blown the GDPR to pieces um, and are mass collecting data through Office 365 telemetry with no Can you explain problem. GDPR to folks who might not know what that is? I mean, I yeah, sure. So educators know. GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. It's a new piece of European legislation. I think our data protection legislation is pretty good anyway relative to other parts of the world. We tend to think of data protection as a public good um, rather than kind of a disincentive to the economy. Um, but the GDPR strengthened further our data protection regulations um, in, in quite positive ways. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things it did was institute some really, really seriously disincentivizing fines um, 20 mil, I think it's 20 million euros or 10% of turnover, dependent on what's larger, which, you know, even for a company like Microsoft should be enough to make them think. And it seems to have done because this, um, this government, Dutch government report um, 
it has prompted Microsoft developers to start working on making the product compliant. Um, but there's there's a tweet on my um, Twitter feed if you're if you're interested. But it was. It, Can you link over here? What was it? Can you put the link over here so we can find I put the link? There you go. There's the link to my. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's not it's not an interesting um, story because it's Microsoft Office 365, which is like the most boring piece of software on the world in the world. But um, you know, you think you're editing a document quietly and privately on your own computer, and that's not what's going on. Um, I think if you backspace a few times because you're having problems spelling a word. The, the software will then start to store, I think, the sentence before and the sentence after what you're typing. That all goes back to Microsoft servers, for example. So, so basically what Google does all the time. Yeah, but you're, you're using apps on your own laptop. You don't think this is going on. You might expect it if you were doing something in your browser, but not necessarily with apps you've got installed on your laptop. Anyway. <laughs> Boring software, also doing nasty stuff. That's my interesting story. OK, Hannah and Amina Farah, you guys ready to introduce yourself? Okay. I'll go first. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, so my name is Hannah Omsh. Uh, I'm, I'm an architecture student. I'm a sophomore at the American University in Cairo. And I'm all, uh, obviously a student at Dr. Maha's class. Um, so a problem that I have with the privacy, it happened to me recently. There's a platform that's called uh, Snapchat. I'm, I don't know if, you're, if you guys are familiar with it. Uh, you uh, basically take uh, pictures and videos of yourself um, and then you send it privately to your friends. Uh, so it turns out that uh, there's the operators of the platform, uh, Team Snapchat, they see all your snaps and all your videos. Uh, and you, we, you know, most of the people uh, don't know in advance. I was shocked actually when I when I knew that they saw all my pictures and all my videos. And uh, that's the only recent story that I have. <laughs> okay, fast, Thanks, you can go. Okay, I'm just gonna read out what Amina said, and then Farah can go. And you could mention what you were talking about in class today if you like, Farah. So I'll start with Amina. Amina is. She studies theater at AUC, American University in Cairo. She's half Egyptian, half Syrian. Her interesting story about privacy is that her Facebook once hacked, and the hacker sent inbox messages to all her friends asking them to buy him uh, credit for his phone number. And some of them did, actually, but she apologized a while back. OK, Farah, you go. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Farah. Um, I study uh, mass comm in the mass communications in the American University in Cairo, and I'm also Dr. Maha's student. Uh, the thing that bothers me in privacy, also, I think it's the same that happened to Amina, but in Instagram, and I had many followers that I don't know them, and then they started to uh, like and comment on my photos, and I, I was, I was frustrated that I don't know where they come from. Uh, but then I created another private account. My first was private too, but I don't know what happened. I created another account and reported that issue to Instagram, but nothing happened and now I'm in my new account. Uh, interesting. Does anyone know how that happens, that you create a private account but you end up with followers that you didn't approve? Or how does that work? Like, how do they find you if it's private? Nobody knows? So, I mean, I, I think, um, no. Not, I actually have a recommendation if, you, if you're into podcasts at all. And I don't use Instagram as well, but I heard a, a very similar story um, in the Reply All podcast just recently. Um, and I'll look it up and, and post the link here, where people basically bought... Um, user handles for all those platforms um, to to just use them for, for communication purposes and then just use them and drop them later on. 
I was wondering if it's possible that the connection between Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, right? They're all Facebook owned. That if someone follows you in one of them or is on your phone or whatever, then they can do it with the other. But I mean, all, uh, I don't know. Hearing about that. And then Hannah was saying that if you have a private account, you would probably have to approve one, uh, follow them or not. But I haven't tried ever creating a private account because I'm always. You want to say something out loud, Hannah? Yeah. So I had my Instagram account. Uh, firstly, it was uh, it wasn't a private account, uh, and then someone created a fake account and took all my pictures and used it uh, with another name, uh, and I. And he, he, he kept on trying uh, to prove that he's me. So then I turned it uh, to a private one uh, so I can approve on who uh, who follows me and who can't. So only my followers can see what I post and can see my pictures. So Hannah, do you think this was someone that you knew? Or do you think that this was just no, like a no, random? It was definitely it was an, a random person. Random person. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it wasn't like a targeted attack. Somebody you knew who was no, like no, trying no, to come after you. Was, okay. No. Uh, as when I created the private account, it didn't happen. I only approved on my friends or people who I know, and nothing happened like that. So it's most probably it's someone who's who doesn't know me. Hmm. And what, what what do you think the point was of somebody trying? Because let me under I'm, I'm not sure if I understood properly, but somebody took your photographs, created another account with a yeah. different name, mm -hmm. and used your photographs and tried to pretend yeah. like they were a person. It just turned out that that person happened to be you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What do you think I the? What, what, I don't know what's the point behind that. So there was like a person no saying one of our friends dog. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like quag dog. It sounds like a cat fishing. We have actually two of those, right? One situation, which is Alan Levine, he has so many photos on Flickr that they um, that they just used his photos and they, they, they started having relationships with women, asking them, I think, eventually for money or something. Mm -hmm. But using his photos, because there were so many of them, they could you know send different photos every few days. Um, and that was before, I think, Instagram. This was just Facebook and, and, and Flickr and stuff like that. This, with Alec Kouros, do you guys remember? Was it they actually used his name, not just his photos, right? They impersonated him by name. And the problem is that Facebook is not really good at dealing with this kind of thing, like if you complain. So does anyone remember? And, and also, me, if you want to talk about what is. I'm sorry, what did you say, Maha? I didn't hear it went in and um, out. You wrote, you wrote about docs. I, I couldn't hear say out loud what that is. Yeah, I think um, in the case of both Alec and then afterward, um, the same thing happened to Alan, as you were saying. Um, they were calling it doxing. And I think it's an identity theft. And the purpose of it was to try to lure um, people into a relationship with a fake version of their uh, of a stolen identity in order ultimately to get money. Um, and I actually heard a really interesting um, podcast on this at one point too. And I'm forgetting. I know I heard it on National Public Radio, but I've forgotten what uh, it could have been. Something like. Um, this American Life or a show like this, but it, it featured this very same sort of practice of stealing someone's identity, which includes uh, name, images, etc., and then posing as them in order to develop relationships with other people that would be beneficial to to the um, criminal, essentially. What other what other practices? I mean, I don't actually don't know if these all count as privacy violations or something else. And I was wondering if others have, um, like, what other practices do we need to worry about in those terms? I'm sure you have. So um, I was just going to to add to to the last point um, because one of the, the practices that I've um, actually have on a repeat in my lab 
is basically to reverse search all the images that are on the web of me. So every two or three months, um, I'll, I'll just go online and reverse image search all the profile pictures that I've used over the last couple of years to see if I can find them. Uh, Christian, can you say a little more about that? This is really interesting um, because I've never heard of that practice, but I think I need to do it. But what is it basically? You go into Google and just uh, you know start to search for images of yourself to see where they've been showing up and what happens with that. Or yeah, I mean, can you walk us through? Is what I'm asking. Okay, sure. Um, so I don't change my profile pictures online a lot, to be honest, or the the pictures that I. Um, that, that are off me online, there are not too many, com like compared to others at least. And so I have a folder that contains all the profile pictures on my hard drive, basically. And in that folder, all the profile pictures that I've ever used are. So the, the practice that I do is every, I think I set it to every eight weeks or something like that. Um, it reminds me that I need to reverse search all the profile pictures that um, I've ever used. So what I then do is I just go to Google search, like the um, reverse image search, I think it's called in, in, in English, um, and upload my pictures uh, to see where on the web they have been used. And it's actually quite interesting. You find out a lot about where people put. Oh, beside you. Um, so you will actually find, um, find your profile pictures in places where you wouldn't imagine it to be. Um, not always in a bad way, to be honest. Like uh, it might just be a student blog, blog that links to a blog post or something like that. Um, but it's just my way of trying to not fall into that trap. But I don't think there are many ways to make you avoid it. It's just one of the practices that I use to be aware of it, I guess. Does that make sense? Mm. Uh, I'm in a comment to for all all over you you know like my daughter i do let her pop into youtube with her supposedly informed consent she knows it's live streamed or not um but i don't like putting her photos or her name up in public because i sort of feel like those are more and if she pops into a youtube it's not the same in terms of searchability that people go and find and be able to do something with it versus photos which people can do all kinds of things with um, tag, like the way Facebook recognizes people's faces and tags them automatically, that really gets on my nerves. I was, I was thinking though of some, I don't know if you want to talk about this. Today my told me something that I did not know about and that your face, I was telling you, you know, employers and universities can look at your Facebook profile. It said that there are other instances where your Facebook profile, you have to submit your Facebook profile when you look, um, a restaurant or, or a space in a bar or something. Farah, can you speak up about this? I... Yes, it happens a lot in Egypt when you go out on Friday night or any 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 day, any data. Uh, usually, people do not bo book their faces, but uh, nowadays they always uh, ask for your Facebook account or profiles. Or people are going with you, not not only you, but all all the group that, that comes with you uh, to that place because they care about the, the, the public image and the, the people, the classes of people and the every, yani everything that uh, um, gives a, a full pic, a full image of the, the people coming with you. So one thing I'm thinking about right now is what might be best practices then for if we want to ensure a certain amount of security and safety for ourselves, you know, what would be best practices for life online in order to um, try to prevent something like identity theft or, um, you know, obviously, well, I guess we can talk about um, the way algorithms and scraping works um, in terms of our data trail and then how, um, you know, 
our data is being sold to advertisers and political actors, et cetera. That's an issue in and of itself. But then also just like issues of security in a sense of, um, you know, our image and our identity being secure online. What, what would be um, best practices for, is the answer somewhere in the, what I'm thinking, it's sort of a thought out loud, but is the answer somewhere um, in the realm of not being online at all? in order to, to truly like ensure a certain amount of um, personal uh, sense of privacy and security. Um, I don't ask that question, you know, um, rhetorically. I mean, I mean it earnestly. I think you're right. Uh, oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, no, please. Uh, well, uh, no, I mean, I, I think as soon as there's data, there's data. As soon as you use any kind of IT system, there's data. I feel this way quite a lot about the conversations around collecting student data like it's a new thing. It is fundamentally to use technology or not to use technology. Once you use technology, there is data. Um, then the conversation is what what is that data used for? But you, once you're online, it, it's there. Um, and and it's, it's to a very large extent out of your hands. Uh, yeah, I think one of the problems um, is that, I mean, since we've been talking about Facebook, um, Facebook collects information on everyone, whether or not you use Facebook. Um, and so uh, there's an extent to which, yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. There's an extent to which uh, we don't have any control over that. Um, so even not being online, um, so, um, I, one of the, the ways to kind of think about it is, um, in order to have some measure of privacy or, or the, the degree of privacy, um, which you have access to is also dependent on what kind of privacy practices, uh, people around you use. Um, so people upload pictures of people who are on Facebook, people use Facebook and Gmail where other people don't. Um, but even if you've ever interacted with a page that has a Facebook button on it, Facebook has information on you. And even if you haven't done that, which is highly unlikely, I would say almost impossible. Um, they also, uh, which in a practice, they I think they've said they've discontinued this, but they also buy information about people from data brokers, um, which again, like, uh, if you have like a credit card account or a driver's license or um, a grocery uh, discount card, it's impossible to uh, to not participate in that system. Oh my goodness! One, I just discovered. Um, so, in on our campus, the classrooms have a computer that the press uses, and once you log in. On Chrome, it stores, and you have to just the default is that it's just have to start log out of Chrome. But I discovered while while logging out today that it will actually keep any credit card information I wanted on this shared computer that I could forget to log out of any day on my way out of class that a student could come in and use. I mean that is just so that the default would be that it would do that. And actually, I, and I, I don't remember ever setting it up so that Chrome would give me my Facebook notifications. My students will say they get to see my Facebook notifications in the middle of class. And I had I remember very well that I searched for this and I undid it. And then it went it came it came again. This is the thing that drives me crazy. Even when you're a bit aware and you just turn off do your privacy settings, they were they back to doing that. It's kind of like when you turn off location phone and then you can't turn it off. It's easy, it's a bit better on iPhones than Android. On Android, it's really difficult to get rid of it. It's just Horrendous. Uh, Chris, do you want to use that word out loud? Because I, I use it several times, including our shared keynote. So the reason I always use this word, um, extractive, is that um, if we want to, I think one of the myths of privacy, especially when it comes to young people, is that, oh, like they're giving away their privacy all the time. They don't care about it. Um, and why I think it's important to unpack that is that there are so many ways in which um, information uh, is taken from us in ways that we don't have a choice. 
I mean, one a story that just came out recently in the states is how um, how many police departments have uh, used light. Li so there's uh, license plate readers that are concealed all across the country. Um, like, say, if there's a sign that tells you um, slow down, you know, it gauges your speed as you're approaching it and tells you to slow down. A lot of those have cameras in them that read people's license plates. Um, and uh, um, police departments have this information. It's a place, so like mainly it's one or two private companies that that run these, but then they um, have deals with police departments. So, and this is not in particular like like it's indiscriminate. So whether or not you're speeding or a criminal or like, and I I use that term loosely, but it it's indiscriminate about who it captures. It captures everyone going down the street. Um, and so I didn't provide that. I mean, only in the loosest extent to which I drove down the street, did I provide that? Like, I didn't volunteer it. Um, and so that's one example, but there are literally thousands of examples of ways that data is taken from people um, when they didn't intend to provide it. What if it's the same situation, but it's your face? Right, <laughs> I mean, if it's your license plate, but nowadays we've got facial recognition software where it can just be that you're walking down the street and um, a piece of software can take a picture, recognize a face and then tie that face um, to you know information that's stored in a database somewhere about that particular person. And then decide that this person is likely to commit a crime because the algorithms tell them that. Sure. <laughs> I'm afraid uh, some of uh, people were imprisoned, like uh, you know, yani they were, they were convicted uh, wrongly convicted because of their plates, but they were not criminals in the first place. You mean their license plates, or do you mean something else, Emma? You mean license plates? Actually, speaking of that, I do know um, that people in Egypt who use social media were getting um, getting arrested for things they posted on social media. Regard like they might not actually have any anything. Uh, not that that would justify it either, but you know what I mean. But sometimes someone would have done something really silly, like just shared something on Facebook, and they'd be stopped in the streets or things like that. So that's also. This is the thing, like who's who's doing the surveillance and to what degree is it political or is it commercial or or would it possibly harm one to consider them criminals when they haven't actually done anything? On that note, and harking back to what Mia said earlier about I've got nothing to hide. Um, I heard a really good well, it's part of a really good conversation when we were at Mozfest in London. And it was um, the Tactical Technology Collective who do the data detox kit. And they've got these really cute little cards, little bit about sort of credit card sized cards. And they've taken some of the points from the data detox kit and turned them into little 10 minute tasks. Because that kit's like a, an eight day kind of program and it's quite a lot to commit to. Um, so the idea is you've got these little challenge cards and it, each one should take about 10 minutes or less to do. And it might just give you food for thought. They're really neat. Um, and there was an interesting discussion around one of them. And it was just around changing your name on your mobile phones. When you set your phone up, quite often it's set up as Anne-Marie's iPhone or whatever. Um, and quite a few people around the table said, you know, I don't particularly care. And there was a girl sitting at the table who obviously is quite kind of politically active and quite radical, I think. And she said, yeah, that's all very well and good. But if you are walking anywhere near a political protest, then almost certainly the police are scanning for, um, you know, any kind of communication devices in the area. So you might not change, but all the people who are protesting will probably have changed. And then it becomes really, really easy to spot the people, the phones of the people who are protesting and the phones of the people who are not. So that point about I've got nothing to hide that you made, Mia, and the point that you made, Chris, about the way our practices affect other people. Like, if we don't care about that stuff, but somebody else who does, actually, our, our kind of absence of change or our, our, 
our, our practices have knock-on effects that we don't anticipate. And there's something about being a good privacy ally as well that I think we have to consider. This reminds me of this thing that came up. They said at the airports in the US, they might take your phone and, and check what's on it. Um, and I remember very well a lot of white men complaining about that. And I said, are you kidding me? They're not going to stop you. They're going to stop people like me. And they said, yes, but we're friends with people like you. So if they get my phone, they might get your data. I'm like, yeah, they're not going to stop you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like you need to like realize who's vulnerable to be stopped. But the thing is, yeah, if you get stopped, then everyone else you're connected to becomes vulnerable because of your pr practice. So that's what you were saying there. That's a good point. And it's really, really scary then because it means that you alone don't have the agency <laughs> to fix that problem. It's like you have to make sure everyone you know. Chris, you look like you want to say something. Oh, no. I was going to add when you finished. But I, I mean, just to, to add to that, um, part of also the problem is um, the assumption with some of these arguments is that people are actually doing something wrong and that uh, innocent people don't get pro prosecuted or persecuted all the time. Um, and, and, and so part of that is that um, not only are, you know, is all this stuff um, often taken from people, but there are also, um, you know, algorithms that uh, help determine whether or not someone is a target, you know, in terms of whether or not they're guilty, whether or not they're likely to, to do something criminal, um, you know, what the likelihood of that is, like whether or not we should drop bombs on them. I mean, like we, there's all kinds of decisions that get made um, that we don't have control over based on the data that's taken from us that we don't have control over. And like, those things are, um, I mean, it's not a stretch to say that they're often inaccurate uh, decisions that get made about who gets what and who doesn't get what. Uh, that's yeah. kind of why I think merging algorithms and, and privacy is really useful because a lot of this is about algorithms that people assume neutral. Sorry, I was just going to add to that, that Quite often in, in like algorithm or privacy related issues, um, people will, there's this tendency among, um, among folks who are kind of tech or internet, internet savvy to make fun of those people who are getting hacked. Um, and that kind of shifts the focus where it shouldn't be. It should, it should be actually on, on the system that allows people being, um, being hacked or being, um, are having to deal with with their invaded privacy, and not with the the individuals who are try kind of responsible in in this kind of way to um, not be the weakest link in the chain. Because no matter how good you are at those things, there will always be a weakest link in the chain that that will enable others to get the the data that you um, that you have on on others, be it just a phone book or something. So um, I'm just starting to get into the work of Helen Nissenbaum, and I feel like maybe Christian or Chris might be more familiar with her work. Um, I just picked up her uh, um, privacy and context, and I found it compelling because, um, well, she has some interesting ideas about consent um, that I found elsewhere, but this idea that I think it challenges the idea that... Um, uh, going back to this idea that, you know, well, I don't have anything to hide, so I'm not that worried about privacy. And, you know, we, especially with the internet now, like privacy is dead anyway, and I don't have anything to hide, so I'm not going to worry about it, right? And really thinking about privacy in terms of different contexts, right? But um, I might be more comfortable, uh, you know, sharing something with some of you because, you um, you know, where I might consider you friends, but right now we're broadcasting this live on, on YouTube. So once we stop the broadcast, I might feel more comfortable sharing something that I otherwise wouldn't be able to share and that that's okay, right? That these contextual um, uh, areas that, are, that make up our lives are natural and that they're part of the world that we live in. I feel like a lot of times um, when we talk about privacy, the folks who are saying like the, 
um, I don't have anything to hide. They think of privacy as sort of like an on-off switch, that it's just going to be in one realm and like either you have it or you don't have it. And it's so much more complex than that. It's so much more nuanced and it's really impacted um, by the relationships that um, you have and, and the different environments that you find yourself in. I think that's true, Autumn, but I also think that it's very difficult to understand how those environments link together. Um, and so we might be making choices, even contextual choices, that we don't fully understand. I'm not completely convinced that when we go off air, that the conversation we're having is still particularly private. Um, I can see Chris smiling at that. <laughs> I don't trust Google as far as I can throw them. So um, if I want a really private call a conversation and I don't even know if this is true no this definitely isn't true I would phone somebody on the telephone but then everything I know about about <laughs> what happens to telephone calls in the UK says that's not a good idea either um, yeah sometimes idea. someone asks me a question on Twitter and I say I don't answer these questions idea so they send a direct message and they say the same thing I'm like I don't answer this in DMs they say email face to face I'm like no I keep these thoughts in my own head Mm -hmm. because really that's the only way to protect them <laughs> and and i think what we're talking about now really is trust right and and i think that that is a complementary point that's made alongside of these different contextual um places that we find ourselves in um the fact that our uh the fact that the way that we feel about how comfortable we are in different contexts is one thing, but then whether or not we trust a particular context um, over another, I, I feel like that's that is um, that that's another idea, and and it's true. I think that as uh, we're starting to use more and more mediums that capture, collect extract to use Chris's word right our data in terms of um uh facial recognition in terms of text in terms of voice in terms of all of these different mediums that make us up um we're what we're really seeing is a degradation of trust in these um in these areas uh and that's that I mean there's there's a crisis in that um because yeah, I mean, we can't live in a world where we don't, where we just don't trust anything, right? That's just like a constant state of paranoia. Um, so I, I completely agree with you, and I, I, I definitely have a lot of um, uh, issues with trust uh, in in the world around me, and it, I, I'm losing trust all of the time, <laughs> and I feel like there's this crisis of trust right now that uh, I, I worry about what it does to the human condition, right? You know, this reminds me of last week, last thing we were talking about fake news. And Mike Caulfield at some point talked about how doing this, all this fake news things with students, eventually they just become skeptical of everything. So that every authority, they don't believe. There is no evidence that they, they're just skeptical of everything rather than that you know skeptical in a balanced way as that you know some things you can believe but they reach a point where they don't anymore and one of the problems with it is that you know from yourself you sort of need to be open to the you wouldn't normally believe and this isn't helping the human condition as, as and and trust is an important part of and if you just of everything and you're just afraid of sharing what would happen and still I say this and I still know that we're, all, we're not all equally vulnerable online um, you know and so you have less to risk some people have less to risk by, by putting themselves out there so. I think that's absolutely true I think there's a point about trust and privacy is privilege as well and I think we've hinted at that a little bit in some of the conversation but I put in the chat a link to a picture I found on Twitter, but again, it's a physical um, exhibit and it's part of the classroom experience and it's called the Zuckerberg House. And it's just a little map 
that shows you Mark Zuckerberg's house and then the four houses around it, which he and his wife bought to make sure that nobody lives around them. So that's how much trust he has in the world. He paid 10 million pounds to buy the four houses that surround his. Wow. <laughs> 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 that's that's well, a that's lot of privilege. About privilege and <laughs> privacy, isn't it? That's a level of privacy you can only have if you have a level of privilege. But there's your solution too, isn't it? Just by the four houses around you. Yeah. Problem solved. I mean, who wants to live next door to Martin Zuckerberg? Obviously, but still, <laughs> prices were down anyways. Probably. <laughs> I bet they are now. <laughs> So I think regards, regarding the, the skepticism bit, and I, I agree to some extent, and the, I think lots of these conversations kind of drag you down uh, quite a bit. So um, I think there's also fun ways to engage with these issues as sad and uh, horrifying as they may be. And I was just looking this, this up, I can't find it in an instant, but I'm, I'll ha I'm happy to send it around by email later on. There's this one browser plugin, uh, I think that's available for Chrome and Firefox, that basically creates uh, clicks on every clickable button or any, any place on a website that it can actually click. So that it creates so much noise um, that the, the actual signal that of you, the user, clicking, clicking the websites will actually not go through. So, and the, it became a whole, a whole arts project, I think, to visualize and kind of work with the, the data this, this browser plugin creates because it basically clicks on everything that, that it ever sees on every web page that you use. There's lots of other things who, uh, that, that try and visualize these kinds of narratives in, in an interesting or maybe even playful way. And I, Kind of like that with all the threats that that are going on there i think there's lots of um creativity around this theme as well i'm noticing the time it's um almost five minutes to the hour but i just wanted to loop back to the beginning for a minute because we started with autumn mentioned something about um in her recent conference experience they um there was a certain amount of defensiveness about the uh what obligation we might have as educators towards our students in regards to using data um, and um, creating a data trail within the context of an academic exercise. So I wanted to return to that and just ask people what they thought about that issue, because I think it's really important. And I also wanted to ask um, or insert at this point a question around the use of avatars or a, sort of pseudonyms or um, you know alternative identities within the academic context to somehow deflate a little of these responsibilities and if that um, does much at all. Um, I'm curious about what other people think about this. So I've, I've gotten in trouble for saying this. I mean, I, I shouldn't say gotten in trouble. Um, I've been challenged for saying this, um, but I, I'm going to stick to it. Um, I don't think, I don't think uh, colleges or universities, I don't think educational institutions should be collecting any information on students that they don't need. Um, and I, I think they should d delete it as soon as they're done using it. And I don't think instructors should uh, force any student to use any platform that extracts their data. Um, uh, it's an unpopular opinion, um, but I'm, I'm pretty firm on that one. Yeah, I don't um I don't think it's that radical to tell you the truth. I think if you're thoughtful in your in your instructional design, if you're thoughtful in your pedagogy, you can find ways to give students choice. Um if you are using a you know, a platform that extracts data, um students are using that anyway, you know, and students are okay with it. They understand it, they consent into it, but I mean when you make choices for your students, um 
and have assignments. I mean, we talk about, we, I, it, this comes back to the privilege thing for me, right? It comes back to, I have the privilege in, in a classroom setting as an instructor, Instructor, you have a lot more privilege than your students do, right? <laughs> and when you make decisions about how they're going to, um, if they're going to get a grade and what kind of grade they're going to get, and you tie that to systems that's going to um, extract their data, that's that's a really that's not a very good place to be in. And so, just providing options for them to do other things, use other systems, complete assignments in other ways. Um, it's it's a real lack of imagination if you can't do that, and uh, I have a hard time with it too. And were you going to say something, Marie? And Marie, all I was going to say was that what Chris described there about knowing what data is being collected, only keeping it for as long as you need it, only collecting it if you have a good reason to do so. That is exactly what the GDPR obliges us to, to do. I have to have a legal basis to hold the data. I can only hold it, I've got to be clear about what I'm using it for, and I can only hold it for as long as it needs to be held. And my institution is liable for large fines. If, and all of us are liable for large fines if we don't do that. I mean, don't get me wrong, is... I don't think it's perfect, and I'm sure there are all sorts of weasel words that can be deployed in this situation, but um, that's that's the context in which we operate, which which is why I think it's, you know, it's good. Um, I mean, our data protection legislation wasn't, that far off it to begin with but it's more rigorous and one of the things that's been introduced is what's called a data privacy impact assessment and dear god we're european so we love a form um, but it is a, a risk analysis and it's a process of um, recording formally recording those decisions and justifications that i just described and it's published it's a public document that's good practice american administrators actually hate that um <laughs> like, i've got i was just enough. trying to ask about the american context because <laughs> right. i think it's yeah. radically different american administrators <laughs> yeah. will yeah. literally curl up in a ball when you say that but yeah. that's what i mean about privacy as a or data protection as a public good it's a mindset thing we don't, mm -hmm. we don't have the same objections to it, I don't think, culturally, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem different. is that we have, um, when I say we, I mean Americans. Um, I certainly don't mean myself. Uh, Americans have uh, kind of, we looked at, have looked at, you know, Amazon and Facebook and, and Google and, they're, we're like, oh, they're so successful. Let's just do what they do. And um, never mind that what they do is highly uh, unethical um, and dangerous. Um, but so often uh, institutions think that in order to survive, they have to do that. And that's their, their survival is more important than any particular student or that student's information or, or safety. And, and this is the seed of demise. Yeah, I mean, I just did a little bit of a deep dive in um, taking a look at different ethical frameworks and um, especially specifically in an educational context. I didn't dive too deep into GDPR um, specifically, but just looking at like as an institution or as an organization, you know, different places that have developed some uh, thoughts about how do we how do we what are the ethical implications of using data? And, you know, data ownership is a big piece of it. And it's it's really shocking that there's some American organizations in particular that are like, oh, well, we should talk about a shared ownership. And it's not necessarily their data, right? What do we owe students when we collect their data? Well, it's not their data, it's our data, right? Because we're the ones who collected it. And we have the algorithms that like make it meaningful and we're doing all this stuff. So it's actually our data too. It's not, it's not just their data, um, which just kind of blows my mind. <laughs> like for me, that's such an intimate piece of who you are. Like that's, that's a blueprint in a lot of ways of, you know, your likes and your dislikes and, and so many things about who you are and what makes you tick and to, to, think that some organization that collected those bits and pieces of you would 
collect them and then say that they're not yours in some sense, it's just kind of blows my mind, but that's where we are. I just think it's very telling that Chris's earlier comment that at the heart of all of this is a kind of um, value and disposition for a notion of success as the highest sort of um, what matters the most. Um, you know, if these companies have sort of uh, lent us models that have been successful in a in a in a capitalist framework, then that will become ultimately the driving force of whatever else unfolds in societal organizations. And um, this is obviously deeply problematic, but it's also a fascinating point to sort of end on, I guess. I'm thinking about the time and that everyone has to run to the next thing. So I just want to say thank you. Thanks for everybody. Thanks especially to the students who came and shared some stories. Um, we always love that when we hear from your perspective, of course, all educators, um, you know, want to hear from you guys and hear what you're thinking about. So, um, a thanks to everyone. And this is part one of a part two conversation. Um, we'll pick up the same time tomorrow um, for the network Unbound Eck or Equity Unbound um, to talk about algorithms. And we'll do that tomorrow at um, 8 p.m. UTC. Is that correct? I think that's correct, right, guys? That's when we started tonight. Or for me, it's in the afternoon. But Yes, okay, 8 p.m. UTC tomorrow. We're picking up part two and thinking about the algorithmic backdrop to uh, the question of privacy. So I'm signing off. Thanks everyone. Yeah, I'll stop the recording as well.